Thank you, Stuart, and thank you again, Professor Ronco, for the invitation to come to this wonderful meeting. And what I want to talk about today is this notion of stress testing. And we do this very routinely for patients with cardiac disease. And in fact, there isn't a medical trainee who hasn't gone through the process of learning what to do with chest pain, what to do with an intermediate value and some uncertainty, and then use a stress test at some point later to make a decision. And we know that this helps us sort out the uncertainty and usually make a thoughtful diagnosis as to what to do next. And it turns out that stress testing is not exclusively done in cardiology. It's done in all sorts of fields. It's done in endocrinology. And there's a question about, can we use this in nephrology? And so you know, typically the question is about treadmill or dobutamine for a patient with coronary disease. And, you know, one of the things that has occurred to many of us is that in acute kidney injury, there's a lot of them. Not exclusively, but certainly a large component. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the recent history of renal stress testing and some of the things that have happened more recently. Now, for those of you who don't know the history of this, it's actually quite amusing. So it starts off in the 1980s in New York City. And at this time, psychiatrists had completely given up on psychoanalysis, maybe not completely, and they discovered drugs. And they had learned that you had a human, in this case we'll use a cat as not name an individual who may be depressed, and you give the depressed person lithium, they get better. <laughs> and they become a happy cat, a cool cat. So Juan Bosch was out about Sinai at the time, and they said to Juan, you know what, we do know that the theme is nephrotoxic, so we'd like you to take a look at and we'd like you to make sure they're not giving too much of this stuff and making them get kidney disease. So Juan dutifully went upstairs, he would do 24 creatinine clearances on the patients before lithium, and then they would get their lithium and they would be happy again, and the creatinine clearances went up. And Bosch said, this is crazy, we must have the values inverted. You've switched the baseline to pre and post. So they went back and they usually went through it again, and they did it again. And it was correct. The people who got lithium screen clearances consistently increased. Single time. So Juan was left with the deep sort of confusion of why is this happening? And the short story, what took Juan a lot longer to sort this out, is that when people stop becoming depressed and they become happy again, I don't mean like mild dysthymia, you know, arsenal loss, I didn't get the title, the kind of thing that I deal with in my depressions. It is severe depression, you stop eating. And these people, as they got better, their appetite increased. And they realized that something about an increased appetite increased your GFR. And he found out that that, in fact, was protein. And that is how this notion of renal reserve was actually revealed. Now, because EGFR and MDRD and CKD, CKD epi are the norm, and it is printed out on the lab sheet in many hospitals, if you ask an intern or even a first-year nephrology fellow, what does the GFR do through the day, you'll typically get a line like this. Right? Oh, their EGFR is 75. They must live all day long. And that is not, in fact, the case. In fact, if you actually did a minute-to-minute -minute EGFR, um, a, a true GFR, not an EGFR, if you actually put in a, you know, consistent iohexol clearances and did it every five to ten minutes, this is the kind of curve you would see. The three peaks are based on three meals a day you have. And if you have a large steak, you'll have a larger peak. If you have a fully vegetarian meal, it'll be even smaller. And so GFR, like your heart, cardiac output, is highly dynamic. So what this means is you can actually test real reserve by looking at this increase in GFR after a meal. And so what you see here is a really beautiful figure that Claudio made. I'd love to take credit for this, but it's all him. And what you see here very clearly is that similar to the way we use cardiac stress testing and events and physiologic stress and pathologic stress, the very same things are shown and very similar to the kidney. And so this is some data that Claudio actually never got it only has a thousand you know, publications, so I mean, I'm sure we'll get this eventually. But what you see here very nicely is that at your baseline GFR here, when you get one gram of oral protein, and then you go up to two grams, you don't get a further increase in your GFR. But you get this very large increase from your baseline to here. 
And this baseline GFR, when you give protein, hit this point, is your renal functional reserve. And it plateaus. So after about one gram, you cannot, at least with oral protein, get a higher GFR. And Claudio and I have described this as the Bosch limit, named after Juan, who is involved in both Claudio and I's training in different parts of our careers. And this is your renal functional reserve. So if you give a kidney, if you donate a kidney, you no longer see this reserve. It goes away. So you live at a baseline, and you're able to massively increase your GFR in the response to protein. And this is highly adaptive and highly physiologic. And when you look at this in large mammals like carnivores, a lion can do this fivefold higher. Because they will have a nice meat meal after the lionesses have gone and found a giraffe. And they'll gorge themselves on kilos and kilos of protein and red meat. And their EGFR, or their GFR, actually goes to like 300. Right? So all these mammals that have primarily meat diets have much larger capacity to increase their GFR in response to a protein meal. And this is reserve. This is a way of measuring, for lack of a better word, stress. And so if you lose your renal functional reserve, something very bad has happened to your kidneys. Either you have kidney disease, or you have a pathologic state, or you've lost nephron mass. This is most classically measured in patients who donate a kidney. And this is very important because over time, as you lose your functional mass here, it doesn't change. You don't begin to see changes to serum creatinine until you hit a renal functional mass loss of around 50%. So the reason why this is important is by being able to ascertain someone's reserve, you may be able to diagnose the presence of kidney disease or at least vulnerability much earlier in the course. And this has been very well established. The question now is, is there tubular reserve? What I want to show you is a very beautiful paper done in Venezuela. And what they did is they did a very similar study insofar as they gave a protein meal to two, three groups of patients. And this first study is they gave a protein meal uh, to patients. And what they basically showed is that in a group that had kidney donors, which is the solid lines, and the dotted lines are those patients who are normal. And what you see here is by inulin, you give a protein meal and you see an increase in GFR. So that's really interesting. You also see the same mild increase, but smaller increase in patients who are kidney donors. So there's a delta. But with creatinine clearance goes up much higher in healthy folks to the same protein meal than patients with chronic kidney disease. So these investigators thought, hmm, that's interesting. The creatinine clearance seems to identify this difference better with a larger delta than inulin. So they did a second experiment where they did something extraordinary that I've never seen done previously, is they gave patients with normal renal function and with kidney disease intravenous creatinine. Not creatine, creatinine. And this is what they showed. When you give IV creatinine, there's no change in your GFR. So creatinine in and of itself does not stimulate GFR. And this is important because we, as a community, for 60 plus years, are incredibly creatinine centric. But creatinine, if I give it to you intravenously, your GFR is untouched. But your creatinine clearance matters to the person. Because the kidney senses the increased creatinine, it knows it's supposed to get rid of it, and it increases its tubular removal through secretion primarily. It's not through GFR because the GFR didn't go up. Now, if you do it to a kidney donor, you see a mild tubular reserve, but it's, it's not in the same level as a patient with normal function. And the CKD patient has no tubular reserve to increase the creatinine level. So there is a tubular reserve, and there is a separate low and both are informative. And so this has led Claudio and I to really sort of think about how we can test these two domains in both acute and chronic kidney disease to help us be thoughtful in interventions for our patients. So we know that glomerular reserve can be tested with IV amino acids, it can be tested with oral protein, and tubular reserve can be tested with protein loading and IV creatinine. And this can be done in chronic patients, although we don't have protocols for IV creatinine, so it's the only study of this kind that I've been able to find. And I think that's an important question, which is, does this matter? Does your loss of reserve matter? And I would say the answer is most certainly yes. It certainly reveals the vulnerability. 
And if you don't think there's an opportunity to intervene, ask yourself what you do when you have a patient with prediabetes. Do you just tell them, hey, there's nothing to do, or do you tell them to go do some exercise? Do you tell them to lose some weight? Before, we didn't treat prediabetes. We didn't treat pre-anything. Now, we aggressively treat many diseases before they become clinically apparent diabetes. I think the best example, and that we can alter trajectory. And we believe similarly to skin kidney disease. Patients who have loss of reserve, either glomerular or tubular, and they likely have both, are in that information is informative. It tells you something about what's going on with the kidney, and it reveals a vulnerability. And I would love to see the trial where you take a large population of patients who've lost their renal reserve, and you start them on race inhibitors, rate two blockers, and hypertension control 10 years before they come to clinically correct at four, or an EGFR. 45. And the reason why this is is we don't have good treatments for CKD. And if you can prevent it, it's enormously valuable. So what about acute kidney injury? Is there a role for stress testing in this environment? Well, if you're looking to test the kidney and acute kidney injury, the tubule is where your primary interest is for the vast, vast majority of patients, particularly those in ICU. And the areas that we believe the most important are the proximal convoluted tubules, specifically the S1, S2, and particularly the S3, S7. And so if you think about this, we're interested in trying to interrogate. And so we developed a furosemide stress test. And the reason for this is because furosemide is uniquely suited for this role. Furosemide is not effectively filtered, it's tightly bound to albumin, and it has to be secreted into the proximal tubule to do its work. Now, we all do this clinically, and this has been done for 50 years. It just turns out that giving furosemide in particular, as opposed to other loop diuretics, is particularly well suited for this readout. And most of you have seen some of this data, so I'm going to go through this rapidly. But the hypothesis is, if you can demonstrate that a patient is responsive to furosemide, you can, in fact, assess the full integrity of their nephron. These are the data we published some time ago in the Jean-Louis Journal Critical Care. And what we demonstrated is that under a furosemide stress test, which is 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of IV furosemide, you reveal the patients who are destined to do well or do poorly. What you see in the gray bars are those who had a good outcome compared to those in the stripe bars who had a poor outcome. So the simple rule, which you already knew from your training, is if you give someone a big slug of furosemide and nothing happens, Nothing is going to happen to that patient. And we all knew this already. This was simply taking a known clinical bench test that we do and putting some context and some rigor around how you actually put numbers on how you do this and standardize it. And what we demonstrated is that the RC is at two hours. If you don't make at least 200 cc's of urine, you're in trouble. And the vast majority of patients who do well will far exceed that number with an RC cap. Our secret value of 0.87. Now, this is the sensitivity and specificity for this, and this is undergoing a large validation currently with a large group and, uh, of investigators in North America. Now, we also looked at biomarkers and compared them with this. We found that the first much stress test performed very well. These data were published with Jason. But what I want to show you that I think is the interaction of biomarkers with stress testing. But I just want to point out there's three really key issues is that if you're going to use the furosemide stress test, it's critically important that the patient be eubulinic. This should not be a primary test of AKI ever. You can harm someone who is under resuscitated with large sets of furosemide. If this is happening in the emergency, the test has gone wildly awry. This is a test that you go through for a patient when you've made a reasonable risk assessment and you have assured yourself to the best of your clinical ability the patient is eubulinic. Moreover, when you give them their large dose of furosemide, you are obliged to replace the urinary output with isotonic fluid to ensure they don't get into trouble. In our study, we had a few patients who have had extraordinary responses, put out six, seven liters in six hours. Built in the fact that if the urine output increased, we replaced their urine output CC for CC with LR for a second. Because we were concerned on making sure we didn't do any harm. 
So it's very important that if anyone undertakes this, they keep these caveats in mind. And so the, the, the goal here is to basically take it to the next step and say, well, now we have a nice toolbox. We have approved biomarkers. We have good risk assessment tools. And we have, at least in its infancy, some basic stress testing. And so what we sought to do is to put a set. So if you think about troponin as your ideal biomarker, you know the troponin is very low. You can rule someone out as high negative predictive value. The troponin is 0 0.0001. You do not have to be too worried with your patient with chest pain. Similarly, if your troponin is 10 or 20, you ought to do something about it and look very carefully to what's going on. But there is this middle gray area of troponin where you're really not sure what you need to do typically the patients in whom you do stress testing for. And so what we said to ourselves is, well, if we actually apply this to our test, and we took the cohort of patients who had first by stress testing biomarkers, and we basically removed all of these patients who had ruled out by biomarkers. So we used either an NGAL of 150 or an effort check value of less than 0.3. And if you remove those patients from the set who have been effectively ruled out by very good biomarkers, the ROC per value for the FSC goes to 0.91. That's the same performance level as your And so the had lousy biomarkers 40 years ago. They had LDH isoenzymes. Then they moved to CK. Then they moved to CKMB. And then they finally moved to troponin. But the seminal papers that were done in cardiology for acute myocardial infarction was the GC paper, which was streptokinase versus heparin, was not done when troponin was available. That was done with CKMB. The point here is we already have the tools we need to do the studies. And I would much prefer to prevent this constant re-adjudication as if they're good enough. They are. This performance for the, for the prediction and diagnosis of myocardial infarction, ACS, lived around 0.82 to 0.84. We have that now. We're out of excuses, people. It's time to use the tools we have and start making some therapeutic progress. And so the main output goal that I want to point out is functional test work in tandem with API biomarkers. And I just want to just close with the idea that this may be a role for furious my stress testing in chronic kidney disease. We know that fibrosis is one of the best for outcome. And if you look at a kidney that is shrunken down, what you see is the tubules that have been replaced with fibrosis. And if you don't have tubules, you're not going to respond very well to furosemide. And it may really help you, and this is what a post api CKD kidney looks like in the far right, you can see it's shrunken fibrotic, is that we also have all sorts of other pathology in CKD. We have these eight tubular glomeruli. So when you look at the biopsy, perfect. But what you see here is that it's decapitated. There's no connection to the tubules, completely fibrosed off. And so how do we assess tubular function versus glomerular function? Well, we have those tools. You can do a glomerular stress test, and you can do a tubular stress test. And you can see if those two things are in tandem decreased, or if there's variability, or if there's massive divergence. And so I want to close by saying that fibrosis and tubular function, this may be an opportunity to deploy types of tubular stress testing. I'd love to see some community do more glomerular stress testing as well. So the next steps are to do validation studies, FST and API, that's currently undergoing. There will be data that you'll be seeing in the next two months that shows that this works very well in delayed, ref, in delayed graft function after transplantation with an RC curve value around 0.84. And pilot studies looking at the use of furosemide stress tests in conjunction with kidney biopsy to use this as a surrogate for fibrosis are also underway as well. As I mentioned, the DGF data looks very good. We'll be looking forward to presenting that to the community uh, shortly. And uh, I do think that there may be an opportunity to also use this to help time the initiation of ESRD in patients with advanced CKD. And so in summary, kidney stress testing, it may reveal a state of pre-CKD. Renal reserve testing in conjunction, I think, has enormous value. And I think that's important to recognize that API, CKD, are continuum. We have biomarkers. If you I think we can get added refinement in our diagnostic space. Thank you.